Okay, Nate, thanks for joining me, mate. Awesome to be on, man. Awesome to be on. How's hey, things? Yeah, good. Um, obviously, the isolation's a bit uh, bit of a downer at the minute, so um, it's hard getting um, training everything in. But um, do you mean everyone's healthy with me? Everyone's sort of um, doing well. Uh, it's just getting through it and uh, waiting for everything to get back to normal. Yeah, that's it. It's one of those. If you were, if you're in a position where you know you have an opponent or a potential opponent who's training and you're not getting to train, then it's torture. But when you know nobody's training, you're in the same boat. It gives you a chance to focus on shit that you mainly wouldn't focus on, even if that's rest. You know, rest. Um, I've been trying to work on a bit on my flexibility a bit more. I'll see. Um, I'm in a better situation than most. I've got um like a good weight setup here, so um. We've got um, like free weights, bars, stuff, um, all the kit I need to get a good set session in anyway. So um, my SNC coach is still firing sessions over to me and um, we're still getting it in. And then um, I've got keys to the boxing gym as well. So I've been able to hit some bags, get some footwork in and do a minimum. Obviously, I can't do any contact. Um, I can't really do any pad sessions or have my coaches in watching me telling me what I'm doing wrong, what I'm doing right and sort of work on benefiting. But I can still keep ticking over and um, the weather's been nice. Obviously, it's first day really today and yesterday was a bit shitty where um, it's starting to rain. But the sun's been out. It's been, do you know I mean? We've had a crazy good couple of um, last few days, maybe last week or two of weather. So it's perfect to get out and run. And uh, I've been treating it as a holiday. So it's it's been nice. Yeah, which, I mean, you're never, from someone who's obviously been in this a long time, you, you've had a really active sort of three years you know so this time for you now of no contact and stuff is torture for a fighter but you'll you'll value it so much come a year or so time when you're back on the grind and you'll be like for oh, that little bit of rest that i'm probably never going to be in a position to take again like that that'll be worth his weight in gold you know yeah mate i 100 percent agree and um it was my birthday sunday i turned 25 and it's the first time in three years where I was actually allowed to have some cake and relax and because every other time but obviously um so last year I was waiting in for the Desme fight on my birthday yeah. um, which was nice because I got a fight and then obviously I had the Sunday so it was just knocking back two days and I got to celebrate a big win and I got to celebrate obviously um being 24 then but um it, it's different like I didn't know whether sort of when I woke up my birthday whether I preferred <laughs> being able to relax and sort of do what I wanted or whether I preferred obviously being in fight camp and um, grinding towards another opponent. So it is a weird situation, but like you said, it's unavoidable. So when everyone has to do it and everyone's sort of struggling, obviously um, the UFC's back running in, what, two weeks now? I think yeah. they'll start next show. So obviously yeah. the guys there will be managing to get as much as they can in there, opening back gyms. And um, so my friends over in America, I've seen they've been starting to get back training a bit more. And like a lot of them are still training through anyway, but they're starting to get a bit more into it. Um, obviously... America was in a bit of a worse situation with us where there was no furlough. They were just given $1,200 checks and told us all to survive. So yeah. um, a lot of them were still trying to grind as much as possible. But, um, yeah, I, th I think obviously the next week or two now, um, they'll start relaxing on um, the restrictions. And I think um, people will be back to training and stuff before we know it. So I'm just sort of, like I said, I've enjoyed it, but now I'm ready to get back to work. Yeah, I mean, you're lucky as well in that you're, you're a champion for Cage Wars. So if there's anyone who's going to be pushing to get shows back going... It's, it's Cage Wars. And also, the only thing with, with being, for Cage, being signed for Cage Warriors and obviously being the champion now is the turnover of fights aren't going to be as high as what you would have probably liked as a, being a fighter. But because they're not going to be able to bring in many international fighters, they're going to need you more. So you might be as active as you actually want for a while, which is perfect for you. So fingers crossed everything gets back on track and it's a bit of a godsend for, for you, you know? Yeah, 100%. I'm hoping when it does start back up, I get time to get a fight or two fights in for the end of the year. So obviously, um, Graham's quite good to get me fights, especially when he knows I'll always make weight. So um, it's, I think it's just more sort of wait and see what happens, but um, I'll be ready to go whether it's August, whether it's later or whenever it goes. Yeah, what, what uh, you said about making weight, what did you walk around at, mate? So at the minute, I'm walking around at 83 and a half K. Um, uh, I'm trying to get, I've been trying for the last, um, the last, oh God, year to sort of put some muscle mass on. Um, and then my last cut was the biggest cut I've done. So I come from about 82 and a half. 83 down to 70 uh made weight smack on i was 0.1 under on the test scales before we went official and then um official scales was a bit weird um but as long as i got away and my opponent got away and i didn't really mind but um they were a little bit under so uh, considering uh 
me and my coaches had a bit of a laugh afterwards because they were about three pound light. <laughs> and, uh, but everyone got away pay in. Like it was the only event on. Um, it was the only event going. It was um, all these problems with everything leading up to it. So none of us really cared. But I know I weighed light, Paddy weighed light, and I know nearly everyone on the card managed to weigh under by about a pound or so two pound. Like I weighed in three pound under, and I'm a guy who's every single time, if you look at my previous weigh-ins, I've only ever been the highest I was was 0.5 under, I think. And that was more so was sort of waiting around for weigh-ins. So you sweat out a little bit more. So um, <laughs> it was a bit weird. But um, like I said, I, I, I didn't care as long as my opponent made weight and um, if there was if the scales are light then it's not a problem I just wished I'd had the nod a bit earlier but yeah. uh, it worked out for the best do you know what I mean yeah I mean I, like, I've had a similar situation mate when I fought on uh, on Ultimate Challenge in I fought in the Dominican Republic and yeah. me and Reedy went down I cut my I did about three kilos of water in the morning yeah. kept it, I kept it quite a small water cut because we'd flown and stuff so yeah. I'd go down test on the scales and I was like a kilo over. I was like, no. I was like, we've tested on two sets of scales. They're, they're the scales we're using. You're a kilo over. Went back up, cut the extra kilo, came down. They'd moved the scales and I weighed a kilo under. So I was just like, what? Why didn't you just put the scales where they were going to be for the test? Wet? So, yeah, there's a ball link. But at the same time, you're just so relieved to, to make weight. You don't even care. You're just like, yeah, I'm just good to well, go. Well, that was the thing. We, we test weighed and um, I was... It was something ridiculous, like I was something like three and a half pound under the weight. Like, bear in mind, I am um, so the, um, the scales situation. I go, yeah, I've got uh, scales in the house, um, which is their um, I had a grand when I was in the judo team for like 400 quid. So, we bought like the best quality scales we could get. Um, and they calibrate them every year and they're not moved, they're stuck on a board in the corner of the gym. So, like, my scales have always been bang on, and then we um, obviously they're not moved. Uh, the ones we had are the boxing gym scales. Um, my boxing coach, um, they do a lot of work with the Welsh Hamilton board, so they've got a really um, official set, they've got a, their official set of scales, and they're calibrated every, every year. We took a board to make sure that the weight was smack on, and like, um, we test weighed on there, and I was 0.1 over, so I knew that when I got down, I'd sweat a little bit off, and then um, I'd be close to official weighing by the time, so there's no problem, and then um. Uh, Paddy test weighed and um, he was like there's something wrong with the scales because I'm I, like he was like there's no way I'm three pound and and, uh, and they were like look official scales what official scales are duh, duh, duh. so he was like right so I jumped on I was like three pound under and then uh, my opponent jumped on he was a pound under so me and my coaches looking at each other was like right I have these scales <laughs> there's something wrong with the scales but um, whether he would have made weight or not obviously um, I don't know whether he test weighed the night before they'd been off as well but um I know after the they weighed the main card in, they moved the scales and reset them, and they went back to bang on them because um, Chris Edwards he test weighed and um, he was under, and then they moved them and reset them, and he was smack on then. So um, it was it was a weird situation, but like I said, as long as the whole main card got to make got to make weight, like it's, it was it was a big sort of it was a big event, like it was the only sport event on in the country. Like I did a. Yeah. talk with real talk live um before before it and um like they said the same thing like there's no other sport on there's no football no rugby nothing like it was it was the only of uh, sport event on so the eyes on it would have been massive so i think it worked out better obviously to have everyone make sure they made weight and the fact that i got a fight and there was no drama about your opponents failed weight or we don't know whether the shows in the head it was just nice to get in there and avoid all that and get it done and like i said i got the job done yeah you i'm i'm convincingly as well it was a a solid solid performance um for for a way to win a title i mean to to be fair it's a bit um it's not really a good reflection of who you are as a fighter the performance because like i, I watched it again earlier just to remind myself because i had it in my head that it was quite back and forth and when i watched it the boxing was sort of back and forth but he didn't really land anything he didn't really land anything hard he caught you with stuff yeah i'm still taking stuff which that was one of the things we talked about afterwards because um, one of my friends um, who watched it from America, he said, like, you took more shots than you normally do. Like, obviously, he sparred me a lot. He knows I'm quite fluid. But it's more so I went out there and sort of I started working the leg and then um, he started sort of, like, catching me with stuff. And the stuff he was catching me, it was like, he wasn't really hitting with anything. It was worth sort of, worth sort of, like, obviously, when I fought Desme, Desme was dangerous in everything he did. So I always made sure I was in and out and I, didn't make sure, I made sure that, if anything landed, it landed on the glove or it landed as I was moving away. There was no solid contact. Um, I got a bit 
when I started, so obviously started with Joe, when I started landing on Joe, um, I think the only thing he really caught me with nice was a left hook to the body, uh, left hook to the body, and and the yeah. chop and tie sort of kick. That was nice. He caught me with that. I gave him a nod and smiled. Yeah. And then, um, but apart from that, every, everything I just saw, I think I got into the thing where I started walking through a little bit, which was obviously not a good thing to do. Um, and then when that leg kick started going in, I really started landing on him and slowing him down. Um, exactly the game plan went. So I started pushing on even more and pushing through his stuff. That's when he started landing. But um, yeah, I agree. We were 100%. And then the other thing I didn't like in the fight when we did analysis afterwards was my kick in. Um, I didn't get my kick in range at all in the fight. And my, my kick, apart from the, the low, the low um, Achilles kicks I throw, which obviously um, that's boxing range. Um, my kick and range was out a little bit, so um, like my side kicks and my back kicks, everything was um, oh, well. My reverse side kicks, not back kicks. Um, they were they were all out out range wise. So I took too many shots. I wasn't as fluid on my feet, and um, my kicking was a bit poor. So um, yeah, it's one of them where um, obviously the result was perfect for what we wanted. I managed to catch him with a lovely knee, which yeah. when um, we watched, uh, do you, I've, I've, have you seen him on the Ben Lachda fight? It was when they did the bantamweight tournament. Yes, After Jack JK did. He fought on there against Ben Lakda. They went to three rounds, and they, he won a decision against Ben Lakda. Well, it was it's like round two, I think, where um, Ben starts landing these uppercuts from everywhere, and um, as soon as he shells up, he hits him with these uppercuts. So I knew that I've got a dangerous right hand on, a, on an uppercut anyway. Like I landed boxes firing all the time, and um, obviously I finished people on my knees before. So I knew that if I could get him to shell up with my shots, I could land those shots and get him to sort of start tightening in and get our head down. I knew that them upcuts and all those knees were going perfect. And I just, it wasn't so much as conscious. It was just sort of, um, I hit him with like a, I think I hit him with a leg, then I stepped in with a couple of shots and it was like a left hook, right hand. And you see him sort of shell in and it was just a couple to just make sure his hands were in and the knee went through and the knee just was just sort of well, tiny before, flush. In the exchange before that, you had a little exchange and then you came off the fence. In the exchange before that, you caught him with a left I don't know whether it's like a screw shot or whether it's a little short left. Yeah, up. It's, um, I I throw him like a long up up, up a cat to so it is a screw shot, so it's literally just sort of long and through and I sort of time it up and then I normally throw a back end on the on the end of it. Yeah, well you caught him with that and you could see when he came off the fence and backed off, he started doing what he hadn't done, he sort of backed off and sort of coming coming up into a shell when he's coming off the fence. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know you've hurt someone if they're going to do that. If they're back into the fence and they go into their shell, then that's fair enough. But when he was coming off the fence and still going into his shell, as I was watching it live, I was like, oh, he's hurt him, he's hurt him. And then, because uh, I, I was thinking, you've hurt him, but you're letting him get away with it. I was like, no, he's letting him get back to the centre. And then you managed to cut the angle, which I think is probably the, th the thing that you're, you're underrated for the most, is your ability to, to cut an angle. Um and you cut the angle, which forced him back the other way, which allowed you to catch him again with a left, and then the right over the top, which started the finish. Well, the Desme fight, I did it I did it to, to a very high level. Like, I cut the angles all the time. I was constantly making sure I was on, I was on and off the angles all the time. And then um, uh, one of the things they, they, we talked about afterwards was sort of um, I had chances to finish Desme, and I didn't push on enough. I didn't sort of aim to finish. It was just more so I was just happy schooling him. And then the Alexi fight, <laughs> I went so far in for the kill that I was literally chasing him around the cage. Like um, we watched it obviously yesterday. I did the talk through with Greg and um, uh, Greg and Reese. And um, as he's watching it back, I was like, "Oh my god, please stop chasing him, please, <laughs> just get an angle, please." Um, but that was just so I got so gun ho with him because, like, I talked about that the other time. Like we watched all these breakdowns on Alexi, and he was. Um, the guy who was supposed to have a massive right hand, like he was supposed to hit harder than anyone I've done before, like he was knocking people out, and he was like, look, you really need to be careful with his back hand. So, like, at the start with, I'm picking him up and, like, moving away and making sure I'm breaking angles so that every time he's landed on stuff, it's sort of, it's when I'm moving away, like he's hitting me with his with his right, right hand, just coming around to my left, and I'm always moving to the right, so I'm taking the power out those shots. And then, um, I remember I blocked one on my glove and I was just like, oh, there's, there's nothing there. So I rocked him again I was, and I remember just pushing on thinking, I'm going to finish him, I'm going to finish him. And then rather than just staying calm, cutting the angles and just going and just earning the finish, I remember I just chased it, chased it, chased it and um, ended up those two cuts. And um, that it really irritated me because I remember they didn't even, it wasn't even shots that hit me flush. They were just literally nippy shots. He threw like an overhand right that nipped my, um, the, Nick, my left eye, or whichever one it was. Um, right eye, yeah, right. Right eye, yeah. It was over and left. It lit me in. 
give me a little cut underneath and then he caught the outside again. And they were just literally shots were just nipping me and they were just splitting me open and they were just like irritate me so much because I shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place. So obviously I started taking him down um, and it just proved that whenever I wanted to take him down, I could. Obviously um, he managed to recover twice and as soon as he recovered, I took him straight back down. Yeah, you. I mean, for, for me, watching you, uh, like if I was to w- look at you as an opponent who I was going to fight or something and yeah. I look at the way you fight, you've got that horrible, grinding, I'm going to come at you style where you're just going to come at you, come at you. But at the same time, lots of people who have that style, if you were to look at people like Clay Guida or Diego Sanchez, yeah. people like this. I mean, there are more up-to-date people who do it, but these people are known for it. Yeah, and yeah. If you look at people like that, they seem to lack a lot of the technical ability but what you do really well as you're coming forward you're never you're never in a position where you can't just dip out of range and come straight back with a counter or you're although you're stalking forward you're stalking forward you're never in that little bit where you can just step off at an angle you can just move you can just which i like a lot in your in your style i really like that that when you're coming forward you're always conscious of the angle i mean all right you'd lost it a bit in that um alexa fight you'd gone like a you were looking for the kill but at the same time you were never putting yourself in positions where you were vulnerable to get caught with something big so yeah yeah always just just a, like your head's just about to slip outside and you just so even though you're one of those horrible grinding fighters you're putting that in with that every punch you throw is coming from a good angle so it's got power on it or Technically, you're not in a vulnerable position. So if you throw a shot, you leave yourself open to the takedown, which is what I like. It makes it it makes a horrible grinding style ten times more effective because now you've got the striking ability that's always there as well, plus a really good takedown game. Ah, oh, cheers, boss. And um, I remember obviously like leading up to this fight, um, I sparring with Jamie Cox. So Jamie Cox, he's 25 and two. Uh, one of those losses against George Groves, another another losses against another top pros uh, well can't call them prospects another top fighter, and um, like he's dangerous South poor man we sparring and he was about ninety kilos at at, at the time and um, it was just one of those just like if I can sort of hang in with guys like our boxing sparring those guys that are top of the tree and that they're sort of um, got that intensity and I'm sort of I can fifty fifty spar with them then. Um, What's a guy, a normal MMA guy who's literally concentrating on jiu-jitsu, who's trying to get good at their wrestling, trying to make sure everything, and obviously they're going to struggle, they're going to struggle with me. And um, obviously I was out in Team Alpha Male before this one again. Um, I was out there for <clears throat> the first couple of weeks, and I think I had five weeks or something back before I fought. And then um, the first um, the first block of weeks I was out there, I was doing a lot of work with Max Griffin. Um, obviously he's a wild weight big. He fought um, Charles Oliveira on on um, the... UFC card, I believe that was two weeks before I fought, something like that. Um, so the two of us were in fight camp, and two of us had some crazy sparring rounds in, and um, like, like they were 50 50 rounds, um, mostly striking. Uh, wrestling, he was um, wrestling was a bit more sort of leaning towards him. Like, um, we did situational wrestling rounds mostly where we're one person against the cage and the other person taking them down, and um, like, I struggled taking them down, and he sort of seemed to take me down quite uh a bit easier than I could sort of get a uh, defense um, obviously weight wise as well but um, he's it's something I'm working on and getting to a place uh, where obviously th- at this this fight I felt that my wrestling was the best it's ever been um, like I took down guys in Team Alpha Male who's got a reputation for never really being taken down um, my Jiu Jitsu when I come back even though it was one of the things I didn't really concentrate too much on I remember I was doing rounds with Jamie uh, he was like uh, just over a week out and um, I was throwing subs up left, right, centre and um, like he's usually a guy I normally struggle with just because he's like, he's a big dude and he's got good jiu-jitsu and um, I remember like I was throwing subs up and then he was actually consciously having to, to, to escape and um, he said after it, he said, he said that honestly, mate, it's the best I've seen you jiu-jitsu wise and Greg was really shocked because it, was, it wasn't something we were sort of concentrating on for this camp and he just sort of, it seemed everything come together, that everything felt good and to be honest, um, like, Warming up for that fight, I didn't, yeah, I didn't even feel as if I was sort of 100% peak. Like I've warmed up in fights before, and even if I performed bad in those fights, I remember warming up thinking, oh yeah, I'm really hitting, really hitting well and really moving well. I feel good, my kicks are in range, and I remember warming up for it. And um, I remember I couldn't really get my kick in range into so many good. I remember uh, too good, and I remember we was warming up, warming up, and. Um, they give us an odd to go, and it was just sort of like, oh, well, we, I'm ready anyway, it doesn't matter, I'll just knock him out, and um, obviously we got in there, and I put him away, but um, 
it's one of the things where I'll, I'll, obviously um, I'm always getting better. So I really can't wait to get back back to normal um, and get back to improving. And um, obviously I was hoping to book another training camp out of Team Alpha Mill for the end of the year. Um, whether that's going to happen or not this year, I can't really see it. But um, it's one of the things where it's, it's really it's a really exciting time for me at the moment because. I'm so close to getting in the UFC. Like, I, I can literally feel how close I am. And um, also, I've got a big shiny belt to defend, and I know I'm going to be fighting against guys. Like, I, I really want a UFC veteran next. That's what I want. Like, um, I really want someone who's been there, who's sort of, um, who's made the cut, and um, they fought in, in the UFC gloves and come back out. And um, if I can sort of put a crazy performance on against that and I can put someone like that, that away, then um, surely UFC are going to sign me. And um, it isn't sort of, I'm not one of those people who's going to be like, look, I'm waiting for UFC. All I'm going to do now, I've got the belt, I'm just going to wait. Because yeah, uh, I've, I've quoted this before and it's, um, oh, what's his name? Dan, um, Dan Hardy. Dan Hardy's quoted with, um, obviously, he had a UFC contract in his hand turn up to, a, to his um, Cage Warriors fight. And, um, they were like, well, if you've got a UFC contract, why are you fighting? And he said, well, if I can't beat these guys, then why am I looking to go to UFC? Yeah. And then, like, Nad, I've spoken to about, this, uh, about it before, and he's got the same mindset as me. And um, he sort of, we got like a house on fire because literally we, we both sort of think the same thing. And it's like, um, like UFC's a step up. Like, um, Cage Warriors at the moment is, to me, is sort of like they're my university days. That's me where I sort of reflecting what I could do, ready to go into in the working world and ready to really start showing it that I am I can hang with the best. And um, the longer I stay in cage warriors, it's not exactly like I'm going to stagnate. I'm just going to keep, in, I keep getting better. Like, they'll keep finding me, guys, and I'm just going to keep perfecting what I can do. So when I do go, I'm going to make a statement. Like, Jack made a crazy statement. He went in there, um, sure, obviously um, dismantled the guy, um, and he was literally just... I remember watching that fight just saying, oh, here we go. Uh, this is, wait, when's the finish going to come? And I remember him working it. And it, it was the second round. He choked the guy, but, like, the guy didn't have an answer for anything he did. So yeah. that's the statement I want to make. But um, obviously, I'm not a guy who likes going in and taking people down and aiming the subs. I like to make it explosive. And if but I finish on your feet, I will. You're already fighting guys who are after. I mean, uh, that Alexi, isn't it? That Alexis. Matt Yeah, and he beat Thorn back, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you're and so you're beating guys who are are good enough to beat UFC level guys. You're already like, I mean, this is the only thing from me. Obviously, I mean, I'm I'm right at the end of my career, even if I fight again. And I look back at my at my time now, and I think like the UFC for me to get signed to the UFC now would only simply be for me because I wanted it back when nobody even knew what the UFC was. It was my dream when nobody was, like, that was what I wanted. So to get signed for me now would be about completing a dream. Like, you know, when you just, like, I completed a game with a tick off the box. Um, it wouldn't be maybe a reflection of my ability. It would be about a dream. For someone like yourself, you're you're 100%, I have no reason to blow smoke out your ass, you're 100% a level that you can go in the UFC and you can compete now. And what you want to do is you want to know that when you go in the UFC, you're not in there to compete. You're there to challenge. You're there to just like, well, I'm not here to compete. I'm here to set a standard and start leaving people behind. And I think every fight you get in Cage Warriors now is your chance to show, like, when I come, I'm not coming to compete. Yeah. To, to start climbing the ladder. Yeah, that's definitely. And like, um, like for me, um, UFC's... UFC's never been a dream. Like, I know people say, like, oh, I dream, like, it's always my goal to get in UFC. And um, I've always hated that because it's like, I'm the type of person, um, we, I've talked about this before, where, you know, remember you're in school, um, obviously it's a bit further back for you than it was for me. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> they ask you, um, oh, who's your I idols? And I've, I've had questions before, um, who's your idol? If you had to pick one MMA fighter, your idolize, who would it be? And I've hated that on fighters because I don't I idolize anyone. Like um, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I just want to go in and then like like Justin Gaethje, I love Justin Gaethje's style because like he's um he's a crazy good wrestler and he wants to go in there and um like I remember he did an interview and he said, Look, he said, check my record. He said, You either get knocked out or I'm gonna knock um you're either gonna knock me out or, or I'm knocking you out. He said that's the only way it's gonna go. And um like that's a guy who's like top the tree and then people are like oh so is he your idol or no i just really want to fight him <laughs> it's like i'd love to get in there and sort of share the cage with these people and show that i can dominate these people and it's like they're puzzles to me it's like coming up with an answer to a puzzle it's like how would you beat them and it's like well you can't take him down so you have to outstrike him and then how would you outstrike him and it's like um 
He's like, well, you're just apply pressure. Um, you apply pressure in certain ways, smother their technique, keep the pressure on 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 them, making sure that you, those leg kicks don't constantly land in. Every time they work, you're throwing something back. And then you have to know it every time you throw something back after he throws something, he's going to throw something back again. So you need to be ready to go again. And it's just, these are these puzzles that I, I want to actually have to work out myself. And these are these challenges that I want to be, I want to be sort of gearing up towards and the other people I want to be fighting. So it's exciting for me. And like, I've trained with guys like, um, I trained with Tofik. Um, I can't say the guy's name, but he re- recently won the lightweight cha- uh, championship tournament in Rizan. Mm-hmm. And like, I trained with him and, um, like, honestly, if um, you give me a year to fight someone like that, I could literally take him apart. Like, I remember I could out-wrestle him. Um, his striking was insane. Like, he's probably the best striker I've ever really d- uh, dealt with. Just, like, <clears throat> the angles he cut. Like, I've trained with Selby, and um, Selby, he's so fast. But this, like, heap of pressure on me, the way not many people can. So, I remember uh, it must have looked like two, um, two spinning tops hitting each other because I remember, like, I cut an angle, and then he then he cut another angle on me. Then he cut another one. Then I was sort of trying to come out the back out and try and cut another angle. Then he was cutting another angle on me, and it was just sort of like boom, 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 boom. And like these these are the guys I love training with, and these are the guys I love to fight because it's just sort of like um, like how do you beat some someone like that? And they're the sort of questions I I want to have to deal with. Like th- those are the ones I want to do. Like I I I don't want to go to UFC and have an easy run. Same as my Cage Warriors run. My Cage Warriors run has been hard. Like. I remember we we talked about this before, and um, like every single person I fought in Cage Warriors, when I fought them, had a winning record. Then, and, and every single person I fought, um, it's a good question for you. Um, obviously, I don't I take critique really well. I I love getting cr- um, critique because when you tell when you can talk about, it and you can say, look, oh, you did this, you could have improved you. Then that's perfect because that's how you improve. And um, like all my friends and like um, in team Alpha, the team alpha male guys, they message me and they say, "Oh, like you struggled in this area. Like when you come next, we can improve that." And that's 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 for like year in. So um, looking back at my fights, I don't think I've ever lost a round. Um, obviously, the, one of the Desme rounds was the, close, but I think I I nipped it. Um, if anyone watching does get an opportunity um, to check back my fights, and if you can find a sort of a fight where um, you think I could I'd lost a round, then drop me a message and let me know. Um, it really helps, guys. And obviously, same for you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think your, my only critique for you would be in things that that you do wrong, uh, getting too intent on looking to hit someone, getting too... I mean, it's this is one of my biggest critiques about Nad, yeah. because obviously I've seen Nad from his first ever fight, and he's trained with me all the way up through. So for me, like, it's the same thing with Nad. It's not so much even things that you're doing wrong or... You're allowing people to do things to you. It's nothing like that. It's literally like you might catch someone and then you get drawn forward to try and finish this. But that uh, will only come from experience. Yeah, yeah. And what you're lucky enough to... I mean, I I think of you in like as my sort of era of fighter because what you seem to do... And we've sort of gone about this the wrong way around. Talking about, <laughs> career, talking about the end of your career now, as opposed to the beginning. But what you are, uh, what you sort of do is you, you, you apply yourself to a lot of different things, and then you make it your style. So when obviously I started and Paul Reed started, that's what we, that's what we had to do because there was no MMA. Like me and Ronnie Mann, I remember me and Ronnie Mann. Ronnie was like sixteen, and we're in the gym, and we were training, and he's, uh, we were sat down one day, he went, ah, I don't even know what MMA is. <laughs> Said, we don't we just do our own thing and put it together and that was what it was like for us and you're sort of the same you're you are you're off and you're trying so many different things like if i'm right i could be wrong if i'm right you do like taekwondo judo um boxing thai grappling so for i think you do it the right way round because i think that's exactly what mma should be i don't think mma should be this one sport that we teach people and of course everyone's different but i think mma should be you should be challenging yourself because there are people out there who will go to a taekwondo class and then it's never going to fit their style. There's no point in pursuing taekwondo anymore. It's not going to fit their style. Try it, see if it works for you. But at the same time, that same person can pick up another class and make it applicable. And I like that about you. I like the I like that you're versatile and you're always looking to adapt because it brings it into your game. And then when you've got all those attributes, now it's just a case of the composure and... I mean, you've never been really badly rocked hard or anything like that. So these are all things that can happen in your career that will only make you a better fighter. Other than that, I can't 
I can't say like, oh, I think you should maybe when you throw your right hand, you step too far to the right. Or there's nothing about you in that way that I could critique. Just little things like finding that composure. But at the same time, you need to be in the fight at the same because you've hit the guy. You like what? So when I fought Lawrence Tracy, um, I, Paul and that were like out wrestling. You'll out wrestle anyone in the division. Out wrestling. And uh, I was like, I'm going to knock him out with the right hand. <laughs> we're like, out wrestling. I'm like, listen, I've seen how he fights. If I hit him with my right hand, I know I've got a big right hand. I said, like, if I hit him on my right hand, I, I'll knock him out. I know I'll knock him out. And then the fight started and we started trading. He hit me. I was like, oh, fuck this. I'll wrestle him. And then uh, I grabbed him and he was solid. He was like, uh, he kept, must have come back in about 85, 88 kilos. He was massive. And uh, I went to take him down. And because he's so short as well, his legs were stock. I was like, this is going to kill me trying to wrestle him in the first round. Let's go back to boxing. And I clipped him with a right hand. And I'd just seen his eyes roll back a little bit as I clipped him. And he stumbled. I was like, I've hurt you. So then I was watching him. I thought, he could be rope a for me. So I go forward and I hesitate a little bit. And I just noticed that his eyes were just sort of looking around instead of looking at me. I was like, oh, you're fucked. So I knew I could head kick him. But it was having that that composure to know. Yeah. I, I just him. think on your feet. Yeah, but also because I could see his eyes. So it's only for me to say to you, oh, yeah, you kept going forward. But you might have just noticed Alex's eyes had just rolled to the side or well, something. Was, I I'd catch him with stuff and I could see, like, his, like, watching it back, like, his legs are sort of, you know, when, them, like, you rock someone and their leg is constantly twitching because they're literally, like, you see the nerves firing in, yeah. in, in their legs. And, like, he was struggling to put weight on his back leg and I'd hit him and then all of a sudden he'd, like, rock a little bit. And, like, I knew I'd rocked him a few times. He was just sort of, like, he was just... He was so tough. Like he, I think that showed. I put that Kamara on on him, and then like I bent it. I remember his his hand was nearly touching his neck. And like if I had had a minute, if there'd been a minute left, and I put that, that sub on, I think I would have finished it. But he was just sort of like I could hear Greg saying like ten seconds, ten seconds, and I was literally just trying to snap his arm, and he just I couldn't quite get the angle right. And um, it was he, he was just so tough. Like um, he really didn't want it to be over, and um, yeah. he really hung in there. But um, yeah, like. Going back to what you said, like, um, same for me. Like, I've been training since I was seven years of age, so I turned 25 on Sunday. Um, so November, I would have been training more 18 years. Um, 18 years, yeah, 18. Um, so, like, I, I I was around in the days where, um, like, I started with the Bland Brown and all, and they were doing the same things. Like, they didn't know where to train. And then um, I went to kickboxing where, obviously, um, I ended up with Falcons. So, the guys like um, Jack Short started training when he was a kid. Shaky was there learning um, learning everything. Um, obviously, Joe, the, Joe Duffy was there. Um, I remember there was loads of the sort of the older the older generation, um, like Andrew Baton, um, Hugh, um, Daryl, like all these guys. Like I know um, and Andy B still trains over Celtic Pride. Um, uh, Daryl still trains over Tulare. So these guys have always been around for years, and they were all trying. And like, like you said, there was no set. MMA, like no one really knew anything. Like, so if, I know Jax was a first generation of purse of sort of fighter who's come from a gym that's specialized purely in MMA and they've sort of they've concentrated their sort of their teachings of it. Whereas I went about it the, the other way, where like, like you said, I sort of trained judo for high level. Um, my jiu jitsu, I tried to do as much as I could. I pro box for a little bit. Um, I had good kickboxing from when I first started anyway. Um, and obviously, my grappling the same. So we sort of just try to improve them as much as possible. And um, the one thing I will say that um, I do differently than, than what we sort of spoke about is I don't like doing classes. So the only classes I, I really do, uh, jiu-jitsu classes, I um, sort of just because it's the only way for me to sort of get sessions in because um, there's no really difference in a jiu-jitsu class to a private. But um, most all my all my striking, um, apart from my spot, well, all my striking I do, um, apart from one, I do privates. I don't really do classes um, just because I prefer it to be sort of molded towards me. So uh, my boxing, my boxing sessions are always just me and a boxing coach. And they're always working on stuff that works for my MMA. Uh, my Taekwondo coaches off season, if um, we get time, he'll actually teach me um, Taekwondo kicking. Most of the time he's just sort of helping me to improve my leg chambers, my leg control, my, um, sort of like mixing with my kicks. It's one of the reasons, so the oblique kicks I throw a lot, the side kicks to the knees, yeah. um, those, the Achilles kicks, that's where all those those come from. Um, spinning uh, spin hot kick, I've been drilling a lot. I've really thrown it in any of my fights yet. 
And my, my reverse side kick, I use my jump, my jump spinning back kick, sort of. It's a reverse side, as my girlfriend corrects me. But, was, it, uh, was it your last? Was it your Desney, last I used it a lot. Like, were you, no, you threw a spinning heel kick on one of them, just missed the guy on the fence. Was it this one or was it Alexis you threw it against? You were this one, the fence, you I, threw it. it was supposed to be, uh, it was supposed to be sort of like, it was either a spinning hook kick or it was a back kick, but um, it just went missed. But it was terrible. Like, I come out of my girlfriend was like, that spinning that hook kick you did was abysmal. I was like, it was supposed to be a back kick. And she was like, honestly, she was like, you, you, you're a disgrace. She's like, my friend's going to think I've been teaching you that. Because um, obviously my girlfriend, she's um, like Commonwealth um, Games. She had a bronze medal in, in, in the Games when she was like 15. And then um, she won an Olympic qualifier in, in Olympic style taekwondo and was in like the GD team. And um like she's knocked out more people than I have, so um, <laughs> she's so dangerous. Like, <laughs> like I remember when it, when we first got together, and um, obviously I've always had respect for Taekwondo kickers, just because obviously um, I've been kicked by them for so long that I know that like the way they kick, it looks so fancy and flicky, and then they kick you, and you're like, <gasps> <laughs> I literally like broke my ribs. But um, I remember we we were messing around the once, and I had the body arm armor on, and. Um, was messing around and um, I had a big kick shield and a body armor underneath and I, I had it on the top and um, she side kicked me and she um, she calls them check in and she, she kicked me that hard literally the whole of my arm just went black like literally I had a completely dead arm and then um, thick shield she managed to stab me through and then she catch me and she definitely hit me full pace she gave it the oh I wasn't kicking as hard as I can <laughs> I was like she definitely gave it me to show me she could kick and she side kicked me through the shield and literally my entire arm just went black yeah and um it was just like oh i'm not doing it again like i said when oh, i'm just gonna take you down whenever you get chops you know so um <laughs> <laughs> you can't do jiu-jitsu so it's good but um yeah like that's one of the things i really like about um, mma is like there's it's a, it's a growing sport all the time like you have to be good in every single area so like um i'd never done knees now elbows before like there was when i was coming through the like, even like the when I was doing MMA with Falcons, they never really did elbows or knees because um, obviously I come through Heathgate um, when he first started and he was teaching all the guys there and um, they didn't really teach knees or el elbows. It was just sort of like you grab the guy and stick a knee in him or you try and hit him with an elbow. And it wasn't until I started tie that I really started working on my knees and elbows and stuff. And um, like still now, I think that's the rawest part of my game. Like um, I don't sort of seem to mix enough elbows in. Um, the only time I've ever really mixed it in is when I've hit my hand in fights. Um, knees, sort of, because I've got quite long long legs and um, I seem to find range with knees because I like to dirty box a lot. So um, it's just seemed, it just mixes it in a lot easier. And um, obviously my last fight, I really should. Well, my last couple of fights, um, the fight against Formella, I had the switch knee that started everything off. Yeah. Obviously the, the switch knee landed flesh and that was the end of that because I remember ha hitting him with that and you just see the panic in someone's eyes when their oxygen just gets shut off. Yeah. And um, it was just putting it onto him and sort of making sure he didn't have time to breathe. And then um, obviously Desme, uh, I tried jump knee once or twice, but it was more so at range. The Alexi fight, uh, it was more so I threw some good kick in. My hands were all good, but I was getting a bit, I was obviously carried away chasing him. And then um, obviously I spent the rest of the fight on top of him trying to smash him up. And then um, obviously the Joe fight, sort of went plan uh, I stayed calm and just sort of picked him up and as soon as I had the, the gap I hit him with that knee and then um, obviously finished him off even though like I hit him with that knee and it doesn't show it enough in the fight but I remember uh, I hit him and I remember the knee coming in and just feeling his legs collapse like he didn't he didn't fall before his legs literally collapsed underneath him like yeah. he, he was gone like he sort of managed up her hand up but he was there was no defense there. I remember I just put a couple into him to make sure that he wasn't going to get a chance to. Richie, you were looking at Richie as much as to say, "You, you need to stop this." Like, you yeah, know, I could. <laughs> I was a bit excited, and then after the fight, I, I still laugh at this because there was no crowd, so I didn't know what to do because there's no point jumping up on top of the cage like waving to the crowd when there's no one there. So I remember seeing Greg because Greg was that excited. He jumped up and was climbing a cage. So um, I flew over and like. I broke his glasses again because I jumped on it so hard and then um, it was just sort of like I, I, the camera cuts off you don't see it but I'm back in the um, like in, in the cage and I'm just dancing around for ages and yeah. um, after uh, it, it was just it was a funny event it was it's going to be up, up, up there I think for one of my um, my top events and oh you'll never you'll never forget that like fighting in front of nobody is it must be so <laughs> Fucking, I mean, I've done that in the past just because nobody wanted to come and watch MMA events. To <laughs> <laughs> so fight in an event that is behind closed doors, it must be 
it must have been so surreal to like because I mean, no matter where you fought, I mean, I fought in front of like five thousand people in Brazil, and they're all Brazilians, and they're all cheering for the Brazilian guy, and we fight, and it makes no difference. Like you're one person, it just you're just you're fighting a guy, you and then you'll catch someone or they catch you, and you'll maybe hear oh, or oh yeah, like, or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Other than that, it might as well be in a quiet room, minute, but to be in a silent room with no atmosphere must have been must have been strange. I do, I don't know, mine because like. Um... I can remember it was just sort of like, like the walk was the worst. Like, not so much the worst because it was funny, but so before we made the walk, they brought us down and like you stand waiting, and they brought him down, and he literally. So we come downstairs here, and thought they brought us down, and they had us waiting around here, and he came through this way, so he came down, went past me, and then round the other side. There's a little bit of a like it was like a little bit of cloths, and bear in mind it's dead quiet, like no one's out there fighting. So um, all we can hear is this call me going, come on, Joe, you can do it, Joe. Bring this one home. And then, um, like, <laughs> Greg is there, like, laughing at me, and I'm just sort of, like, dancing, dicking around before we make the walk because it was just sort of, like, I was so, like, chilled out that he's laughing and joking. And um, we were just dancing along to the music they have playing in the background in between fights. And, um, and then Craig chucked his, his phone on and pressed play on the music on his phone. And then um, we had a little bit of music, so he's, like, staying warm, stretching and all, and, like, dancing around and all. And... Um, Obviously, they're talking, and I'm getting my my head in the right place. And then um, I remember the walk started, and I was like, um, I was like, oh, I'm just just going to enjoy myself. So I danced all the way out, and um, it was just it was it was surreal for me. Like I think I preferred the walk with um, out so many people there because like one of the things we always struggle with is people try and grab you as you're making a walk. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, like you, like you know, of course, like when you're ready for violence, you don't really want someone grabbing you or trying to pull you in for a photo or something. So everyone's reaching out to sort of touch you as you come past. And it's always been a problem on, on my walks. Like I remember my second fight I fought against um, Brett Hassett. We fought in um, Adrenaline. And I remember um, there was people like sort of just like brushing past me and knocking me out of the way <laughs> so they could get back in. As I was supposed to like, get ready to make a walk. And like I looked at the security guard and um, I looked at Greg and Greg was like, look, you're going to do something on it. And he was like, oh, it's not my problem. And, I was like, <laughs> and then Greg's like, turning into the security guy and pushing people out of the way so we can make our way to the cage. Like, um, like those, those times are past, and I think I'll be looking forward to um, making a nice walk in a, in a sort of UFC get-up and we have a nice pair of UFC gloves on. Yeah, yeah. You, I expect, where do you walk out? Could you walk out with your flag and stuff as well? I guess you're easy for people to grab as well, which would be annoying. It's annoyed me when I've cornered people in like in Pride with James Thompson. It was so massive, it was never a problem. Then you have KSW, which was massive as well, 60,000 yeah. people or something. But when James is walking out or when we're walking back, it was more when we're walking back after the fight, you're walking through everyone. Like, it's mayhem people want to touch you and then because they're not trying to touch me they're trying to touch james people's hands are in my face and i'm like oh, he's massive. See, that's what that's never a problem with me because i'm like, walking back after like the cage boys events remember the last time we walked back and i had those two cuts on my eyes and like they're like look you need to get them stitched and i like, yeah 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 and i'm stopping my photos of people and like yeah. greg's like come on let's go and like um because craig and Lyndon are really chilled out because greg's the one that's sort of like he's always mr serious and like, we He's such a panicker, Greg is when it comes to it. Like, it, <laughs> like I'm always chilled out because I, I'm always ready for violence. And like Craig is just sort of so laid back, he doesn't care. Like he's the the way he is, he's always the same. But my boxing coach is the same. He's just yeah. like they're all laughing and joking. So like he's trying to get back and I'm stopping photos all the time. They're like, look, you need to get stitched up so the doctors can basically leave. And um and then um, obviously they managed to drive me back and I'm laughing and joking with the doctors and then um, my missus, uh, well, I've got on, on my phone this video of it, and they're trying to stitch me up. And when they're trying to stitch me up, they're like laughing and joking, like this. And they're like, no, you need to keep your head straight. <laughs> and then she's like, look, keep your head straight so they can do a good stitching job because you already, I got one stitch year where they stitched and they didn't put enough in. And this one year, they, they didn't put um, enough in on my left eye that um, it was like one more they could have done. So there's a little bit of sort of like scar tissue there that obviously I'm not that happy with because it's obviously a lump sometimes so that if someone yeah. does catch it, it's going to stick. So, um, I'm like they're trying to keep my head down and the adrenaline's kicking in and all, and it's just it's funny. It's so, <laughs> so uh, back to the beginning. Where, what, um, when, how old were you when you knew you wanted to fight MMA, and what was your route to MMA from thinking like, actually, yeah, this is what I want to do? Because I should imagine you were quite young because yeah. the sport's been around for a long time for you. So I should imagine you were quite young, and like, what was it that you saw, or was it just a natural progression because you were training with people who were doing it, that sort of thing? I'd say um, more a bit of a natural progression. Um, 
obviously, when I was younger, I tried my hand at my brother. Well, my dad was taking me football, same as my brothers, my older brother, since um, since I was about five. And um, he said he was just too. I know, you had two left feet. I couldn't kick a ball. All I could do was just slide or rugby tackle people. And um, I was just. I was the goon. I was the one who was looking for a fight. And then rugby was the same. Like um, he took me rugby when I was a bit younger. And um, I love a tackle. I just couldn't throw a ball for shit. Uh, but he'd give me the ball. I could run and bump people off, or I could tackle people. And um, hey, rugby again. for me. I'm with you because rugby for me was far too violent for me without being violent. Not, I don't want people to stamp on me. I don't want people to stand on me with studs unless they want me to chin them. I, you can stamp on me. <laughs> You can stamp on me, but I'm going to get up and fight with you. Like So if you don't want to fight with you, don't stand on me. I won't go off on a tandem because I ended up well, but um, sort of like, and when I was when I was a kid, like there wasn't a lot of like youth rugby coming through. Like um, there wasn't a local team where they, they weren't interested in doing kids sports. So um, like I, I needed something and um, I was always an aggressive kid. Like I was always the kid who sort of, like my older brother is very intelligent. Like um, he runs his own business and stuff, and he's always been able to talk. And um, I remember like he'd say something to me, and I just get that angry that I couldn't speak, and I just sort of scream and just swung, swing bombs. And uh, my mom and dad said I was like that since I um, since before I could walk. Like when I was a kid, like she reckoned like he'd irritate me as a toddler, so I just reach over and bite lumps out of him um, <laughs> as a toddler. So it was one of the things where I was always just so angry, um, and I couldn't. I just didn't know how to express myself. And then um, they ended up taking me to sort of, um, they took me to the local grappling gym, which was Carl Parker's. Um, they they were run up there. And um, they were like, look, Paul, um, we'd love to take him on. Um, the, the, we'd love to do some work with him, but it's adults only. Like, they weren't too interested in working with kids. Like, I think I was, I must be about six and a half, seven at the time. Um, so straight away, I was like, look, I'm still insisting I want to go. So they kept locking, and then they found um, a gym in Ebon, Everfail, I think, or Primo, uh, kickboxing gym. So they took me over, in, um, took me there, and um, I loved it. So they were, I went over the park and started learning kickboxing. I think I was about uh, a year or two in. Uh, they started doing more sort of self defense sessions because he always mixed it in. Um, it must be a year in. They started doing the self defense stuff, and like that was the early onset of MMA. Like I remember, so Joe was his golden child, and go Joe was always the one who'd help trial things with him, and um, he'd always show all these um all these self defense stuffs and sort of like double legs and it was just it was just early MMA and um they started doing combat jiu jitsu uh and that was one of the that was one of the probably the second martial art I took up with them. And then um uh when I was ten my dad started taking me to a judo gym uh, in the grappling hall of Carl's and um, they started leasing once a week to a judo gym and it was a kid's class. So I started going over there, learning there, and then um, I got into the Welsh team by the time I was 12 and just spiraled from there. But uh, Craig even says now, um, uh, when I was 15, so they he sort of asked, um, look, when you leave school now, you can come in, you can train Monday through to Friday and we'll pay you a little bit. So um, you've got a sort of bit of money coming in rather than, so you don't have to work. And um, I said, look, I said, um, Thursday nights I'm, I'm going to have to go home because Friday I can do MMA. MMA classes back home and um, he was like well you can't get funded then so I tried all myself so I think I was probably about 10 or 11 uh, when I really started uh, sort of wander MMA and um, my dad started showing me videos and some of the old UFC stuff and everyone saw, everyone was talking about it in, in, in the gym like um, Joe and all those they were all like everyone who had done our martial arts at the time obviously I know you'd understand um, so this was what let's say when I'm 12 11, 12 so this was 13 years ago, so what's that? Um, 2005, 2000, no, 2005 to 2007, like MMA was really starting to take off. Like the UFCs were really building momentum, so everyone was talking about the UFCs and stuff. And um, obviously, Heath was running the Heath run the strike and grapples for years, so yeah. when, like I grew up looking at those and wanted to compete in those. And like, um, I know I made my MMA debut by the time I was 15. Um, I made an amateur debut uh, against a guy because um, Jamie Hughes was there because Jamie Hughes fought on the same show I did and Greg was there watching and um, I fought some guy who was tied up uh, I was 15 and he came in tied up all tattoos over his neck and all and we weighed in and the guy was quite aggressive and um, I remember we fought I had shin guards taped on knee pads on and shorts and that was it and little MMA gloves and um, obviously a gum shield I remember um, coming in and um, I hit him with a uh, 
a jab and, and a body kick and winded him and he caught my leg. Uh, but sorry, I sh- and then um, he sort of come at me, so I shot him for to take him down. He wrapped the guillotine and then I literally just cleaned his legs out, come through. Oh no, he, oh he took me down, but I ended up subbing him in like thirty seconds with like either a triangle um, triangle armbar setup. Anyway, it was um, it was like thirty four seconds, and then um, I think I fought once more. But it was just one of them things. It was just sort of like. When everyone's around you is sort of onto this and all you want to do is fight, it's always the next sort of progression. And yeah, then yeah. everything after that was always to go back into MMA. Like I was, I wanted, um, I wanted to be in UFC and I, I wanted to be top of the tree and I wanted to be fighting these UFC guys at top. And I remember like when I was younger, um, it was always, we'd watch the UFC fights and it was like GSP um, or uh, Chuck Liddell. Like that was my generation coming through. Yeah. They were the ones I watched a lot. And um Obviously, Randy Couture and, and yeah, know, proper but, old school MMA. Like so, really, you like you've been involved in MMA since way before your age should really yeah. state you up. And I mean, you're you're only twenty five, which uh, you're nowhere near your prime even yet. So you're only twenty five. You've got seventeen years of experience, but also not only seventeen years of experience in martial arts. You've been watching. And around MMA for the big portion of that as well. So yeah, yeah, you're you're quite lucky. And I mean, obviously, I teach I teach a lot now. So um, I teach guys who are like 20, 21, and this is their first break into it. And I'm like, oh, do you remember watching this? And like, no, I've been watching MMA for about two years. Like you would be like, you're miles ahead of these guys because it's been on your radar for so long. So these guys who are like 24, 25, who only started watching MMA when the recent champions were champions, you're well ahead of them just because it was on the radar. Well, it was like, um, I remember on the MMA debut I did, when um, it was either my first one or my second one, I walked out with a gi over the top, just because GSP did it in a right red gi <laughs> with, a, uh, with a bandana wrapped around his head. And obviously I couldn't get away with a bandana wrapped around my head because I always had, um, it wouldn't look cool on me. But I, I remember walking out with um, my uh, my bad boy gi on with a brown belt at the time, because in traditional jiu-jitsu I was a brown belt. And like this was before I'd even heard of BJJ. Like um, I didn't start doing BJJ since I was like fourteen and a bit. So I must have done. Yeah, I must be doing BJJ at the time. But um, it was just one of them ones where like I got my yeah. I, I hadn't had a blue belt in BJJ yet, so I had a blue belt BJJ when I was just under before I was sixteen. When I was I was fifteen and a bit, I think, because um, I was the youngest uh, blue belt pair to give out. And yeah. um, I remember uh, we got graded up for it, but. Um, yeah, it's just it's weird thinking back because it seems like so long ago, and um, it's ten years now. Uh, it's coming ten years, so it, it, it is madness. It, it goes by, mate. Like when you're when you're getting punched in the face, mate. Time goes <laughs> Re- I don't know whether time goes by quicker. You just forget big portions of time, <laughs> so it does go by. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's mad, mate. Like you, um, so, like, for me, I didn't get my. I, I think it was about. I mean, I, I didn't get my blue belt until about five years ago because it didn't grade. I just didn't. I've been doing jujitsu since 2006, I think. And uh, just didn't grade. Just didn't. Uh, no, 2004, we're doing jujitsu, BJJ, doing BJJ since. Just never graded, mate. Wouldn't ever turn up to gradings. I'd only do no gi, so I was never a gi class. Like, I didn't do a, I didn't do a Pedro gi class for like. 10 years or something just didn't <laughs> just never did it just, had my, just relied on my judo background for my gear and never did it you know so you've had your you've had your blue belt longer than me you know but yeah it's a, a crazy sport so what do you, do you do anything else away from mma you got any other hobbies or did you just literally it just took over and that was everything oh that's everything like i never really had any other hobbies since then like obviously since um i've been about 16, 17, obviously, I've taken up other little things on the sides. Um, obviously, I read a lot. Um, uh, but then I've done, like, skydiving. Um, I ride more bikes. Um, Where did you do skydiving? So I was skydiving down in, in Redlands. Um, yeah, in Redlands. Well, yeah, I, sky, yeah. I skydive. I, I'm about, I think I'm about 600 jumps. Uh, I did some, like, I did camera work. In, uh, I did a lot of camera work in California yeah, yeah. for tandems and stuff. But then... Yeah. I got into the base and then I obviously I started doing a lot of base then and wingsuit base and lots of base jumping stuff and then got into the paragliding and that took over for me. I'm like competitively paragliding a lot. My oh, biggest class. problem, my biggest problem, mate, was distraction. So if I wanted to go skydiving, I went skydiving. If I wanted to go fishing, I went fishing. And other people were getting their head down in training like you and Nad do. 
And I'm like, but the weather's nice. I'm going to go to fucking Honiton and Dunker's Bar and do fucking <laughs> 10 jumps today because I'm going to film people doing skydives and just didn't help me in MMA at all, obviously. Well, this is the thing. Like, um, it was hard for me. So, like, I remember I've been skydiving for, God, should be my fourth year and I've only logged 38 jumps. So, um, it's just because, like, if I'm in camp, I'm in camp, so there's no distractions outside of camp. And then when I'm not inside camp, uh, and I'm not training for anything. I can. I'm allowed to go and jump, and then um, obviously I go down and jump, and then because I'm skinned, <laughs> yeah. I can only pay for like a certain amount of jumps. Because like I did my FS, uh, my FFS, and it's like I'm qualified and stuff. And then um, it's like I was paying for jumps, and like they're only like 45 quid a time, and it was like oh, it's not much. But then like I log like three jumps, and it's like oh, I can't pay for any more now. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. I know. So, I don't. I don't ever jump in the UK now. I, I've done a lot of jumping in the UK. I don't jump in the UK now. I would, I did a lot of jumping in America. Uh, in like six weeks, I did something like 126 jumps or something because it's cheap. And also, then once I started jumping camera, I'm getting paid to jump as well. Yeah, yeah. But then I was, and then I was only paying for wingsuit flights, really. So uh, I did a lot. I, I have done a lot of skydiving over there, but I haven't jumped now for four years out of a plane base base is different like if there's a crane in bristol i'm base jumping or yeah, you know yeah. I've jumped buildings in las vegas and stuff so i base a lot but um yeah but once i started paragliding that took over well, when they asked me what you wanted to like when we skied in we talked they said like i just want to learn a base jump and they were like oh it was like, no, you you I was like yeah i do i just want to learn a base jump it's like i just want to jump off buildings and like um I was watching the thing, and his, um, it was in New York, it was, and it was their, um, the Red Bull event they did, where they was all jumping off uh, one of the buildings in New York. I'm sure it was New York. And um, they were just base jumping off there, and they're, like, they're all throwing each other off and all. And um, it's just, like, I enjoyed it so much. But, like, my last couple of solo dives, jumps I did, I was just so bored because, like, um, like I hadn't done my, uh, is it FS, formation jumping? FS, yeah. I hadn't done my FS yet. So, um I was just sort of about to start sorting that, and then um, we had about a really shit weather, and then I was in fight camp again, and uh, in the end, I had like I had like eight months on, oh, ten months off with obviously the season and stuff, and then um, I got back in and I did one refresher jump, and I, I messaged him first, but then the guy who run the center, and I popped down, and um, Brucey it is, and um, I turned down, and he was like, he was like, look, he was like, um, can you remember your drills? We went through the drills, and he's like, yeah, you're fine. He's like. When you jump once, I'll watch you at the plane. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and then um, he was like, go. So I did, um, uh, I did a, oh, what's, what exit did I do? I did a, I always did that. I used to love the exits where you'd swing in the opposite way of the door. So you'd swing out, so you're hanging out the plane. Gainer. And, yeah, and then most of the times I'd always had a backflip out. Yeah, a floater or a gainer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, float as they were. So um, float the exits. Because um, obviously when you're, you're coming through the, and you're learning your, your FF, your, your first sort of, uh, AFF. Uh, FF, yeah, you um, you do the dive exits all the time, and um, yeah. that, that dive exits were always boring because obviously you have to do it from kneeling and all. So it always like the guy outside the plane, so I could just kick off and try and get flips out. And then um, I remember because he's while watching me, I just went straight stable straight away, and um, I was kind of boring, did like some turns and stuff. And then the next one, I literally just flipped, and you literally just went into a ball and went unstable for about about probably fifteen seconds when I'm free fall. It stabilized, did a couple of flips and dicked around a little bit and then um, pulled quite low. And um, I come back and he's like, what height did you pull from then? I was like, uh, 5,000 feet. And he was like, did you hit it? I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, mm. he was like stick, <laughs> yeah, stick to your alt altitude. I was like, yeah, sorry, Bruce. <laughs> but uh, they always liked me because, um, like, obviously, I'd, I talk, I'd always pop down. I was quite quiet and I um, I, I just loved jumping. And um, I'm gutted I didn't get enough in, to be honest. I would have liked to do more. And um Loads of time, loads of time. Loads of time. Time. I mean, loads of time. And it gets, it does get better when you get to the, like, we're doing like big tracking loads. You'd have two planes dumping and I'll be leading on my back, let's say, and you're just playing touch, chasing each other through the air. And if you touch my foot, you have to go back onto your back and we'd be chasing. They're, that's wicked. It's really cool. But you, you can do that at 50. Like, you yeah, can, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, mate. And with, which is what I didn't realise. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I, I think... Back, uh, back a few years, I was so used to fights getting cancelled, fight shows getting cancelled, this happening, that happening. That I'd be training so hard for fights and they'd get cancelled two weeks out. I wouldn't get an opponent. And then I'm a bit like OCD, where if I get something in my head that I want to do, I can't think of anything else but doing that. So when I have a fight cancelled, I'd be like, fuck it, I'm going skydiving. Next <laughs> minute, I'm skydiving for six months and doing no MMA. So 
yeah, you're much better sticking to staying focused. Like people like yourself and Nad and stuff. I mean, I try and get Nad to slow down a, a, all the time. I'm like, mate, maybe have two days this week where you don't spar. I mean, just this is really you know? But when you focus like you guys are, that, I mean, it's the way to the top, mate. A hundred percent. You've got yeah. it. You've got your head screwed on with what you're doing, definitely. Nad is an absolute lunatic. Though. I remember um, last time I seen him out in Team Alpha Male, and um, I got out, and he had um, a couple more days before he went home. I think he had about a week left, and he had a big split across the top of his nose. And I went, what the fuck have you done now? And he went, oh, nothing really. We were sparring, and um, one of the boys caught me on his head, split my nose. Did it. I was like, well, I was like, one, that needs to be stitched. I was like, you either need to stitch that or glue it because it's wide open. I was like, and two, just take a day out of that. I was like, or oh, don't do contact. Nah, I'm going home in a few days. I remember him sparring or, and doing all the classes. And every time someone was hitting him, his nose just went <laughs> bursting back open. I said, Nah, I said, the scar tissue you're going to have on that in the end is going to be ridiculous. It was like, just take a day out. It's like, you know, you've got name fight camp. Nah, 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 I'm going home soon, bro. <laughs> and, like, hell, nah. and then he came, he came home and he still didn't get it done. But I remember for his uh, for the last fight, the one that just got pulled. Um, yeah, yeah. He pulled it. So uh, it, I turned up, he's like, Oh, you spar? I was like, Yeah, yeah, of course, mate. So, um, He's like, yeah, I, I was like, I ain't got a gumshield or anything. He's like, no, neither have I. Won't use gumshields. I was like, mate, listen, just be nice and technical. Next minute, we're fu- obviously we're sparring. Nad, Nad does not have, have a filter like that because I was no. I sparred with Nad before and um, Nad is like the nicest guy and um, you know he's always doing it in Nad's zone. He's never sort of like he's never malicious tempy or anything. Oh, but I remember sparring with him a few times and he's thrown shit and I'm like, oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> like we're made with. We're sparring with little gloves at Ped's class on a Friday. And uh, so bah, bah, bah. <laughs> it's just me and him with little gloves because obviously I'm, we won't let many other people spar. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Next minute, he's got no shin guards on for his head kick. Hit me straight in the head. Like, I managed to get my hand up and he catch me in the head. I was like, oh, you, oh, yeah, fuck. No, I forgot we're not doing kicks. Sorry. Like, and then he'll, he'll give me that cheeky little smile and then yeah. run back again. And you're like, fucking hell, man. But then, and then he goes to me, yeah, well, to be fair, though, you are like 14 kilos heavier than me. <laughs> You can head kick me, you maniac. What are you thinking? Fucking... Oh, yeah. Um, I used to go and um, do the Nokia classes at Peds. When um, when Greg used to go up um, once a week, he used to take us up on Monday. So I used to go up, and that was my Monday for a, a long time while I was boxing. Like, I was in boxing camp for most of those. And he was like, look, I can't get injured. Just don't pull on anything too hard. And then, like, me and Ad would have these rolls. And I remember we'd, we'd start from rolling, and they'd just bounce everywhere. Like, most people just clear out. Because they had that little room in Peds. Like, yeah. wasn't it? it was always tiny. And we just bounce from wall to wall where, like, I'd throw Nadas coming and then he'd try and take me down. We'd scramble back up and then I'd take him down and then he'd scramble back up and then I'd throw him or he'd take me down and then he'd just bounce in from wall to wall. And then, like, me and Nad always had crazy roles. Like, that was when I was, what, oh, I was 18. And, like, um, now I'm a bit bigger and a bit stronger. And um, obviously, he's so much, he's gone to a level so much better. Like, this is the best Nad I've seen. Like, the last couple of times I've seen him, he's, like, completely different level again. And um, honestly, I, I really can't wait for him to fight again because, like, the guy's so, so driven and he does so well. And um, it's just nice to see him do well, you know? Yeah, when you, like, when, when I train with him consistently, like, three, four days a week, his level's just so, like, it is so high level. Like, I mean, he's the only guy in the whole gym who can give me any sort of challenge wrestling, you know, and he's, I'm a, I'm a fair bit bigger than him, you know, I walk around about 85, and uh, he's the only guy in the gym who can give me any sort of challenge wrestling, and he's really hard, really, really hard work with that, especially on the fence. You get Nagic on the fence, he's such an horrible grinder, and he's so, yeah, he's uh, his level just, it's just up and up and up and up and up. So we'll be. I think people will be shocked when they see him fight again, especially coming off of a loss. They'll be shocked at just how much improvement he's made. Yeah, I do. So, yeah, but um, mate, listen, it's been brilliant talking to you. I feel like I could talk for fucking hours, <laughs> hours with you. Um, we went about things the wrong way. We found out about the end of your career and stuff like that. And <laughs> but um, in the realms of what's coming up, um. You got your eye on anyone? Not, I'm not saying to call anyone out. That's a bit. I hate when people say, "Oh, call someone out." That's shit. But have you got your eyes on anyone? Because I think, really, in the lightweight division, I don't really see anybody being a. I think they got to bring someone in because I don't see anyone. But I would have loved Sor- Soren. Would have been fucking brilliant for you because I think you'd have been a nightmare for him. He was scared was- though. He he fled like that was the reason yeah. he, he left. Like he dropped the fat out of the way to give that bullshit answer about fighting for two belts um, 
and he was literally just he just didn't want it. And obviously, there was I was coming through, Jai was coming through. Um, uh, what's his name? Who was it? Who Jai, who Jai fought for the belt? Um, Jack oh, Grant. Yeah. Um, all these guys were coming through. Um, obviously, Grant is up there, but he hasn't had a he hasn't fought since he lost against Jai. He hasn't gone back into MMA, so he sort of I think I'm going to end up missing him. I I would love to for him, but um, obviously there's Paddy's there, but I just don't. I just I just not interested. Like. I think I you're way way. above Paddy's level. I think you're yeah. way above Paddy's level, mate. I don't... I mean, I, I, I've not seen anything... I mean, I, I don't like Paddy, anyway. That's one thing. Like, it's not... not. I don't know him well enough just because of the way that he conducted himself after NAD. Yeah. Uh, if you lose and you want to call the guy a cheat, that's fine. When you start throwing accusations around about what people are doing and shit, I'm like... I got no... T- then he's... Yeah, I'll yeah. fight any lightweight. Any lightweight he wants to fight. So I said, I'll fight you for free. I'll fight you for free because you've said that. Like you, you got more to gain out of beating me than I have out of beating you. I'll fight you for free. Because then he's like, oh well, and he went quiet. I just don't like the guy, and, and I think you absolutely kill him. So um, I, I really want a veteran. Um, like I said, I'd love to fight a vet to show that I'm uh, UFC ready and level. So um, it all depends on what the situation is. Like, can they import fighters when it comes up? If I can fight in August, who are they going to get me? And um, I just leave in Cage Warriors' hands. Like, there's no one in Europe or in the Cage Warriors division that I see and think, shit, there's like, that's someone obviously you should be staying away from. And we've talked about it before. And, um, it's like, if you're ever in that mindset, like the way Sorum was, where he was clearly avoiding people and weren't interested, then what's the point in trying to get UFC or Peloton? And then, what is the point? If, if you're worried about people who are like, who are in, in the lower trees and what you're doing, you get up in, the, in, in, in the big realm, into the big pond. Against the big fish, do you know what I mean like yeah. like I want to be fighting the Justin Gaethys, the Habibs, the um, Fergusons, like the Poriers. These are the guys I'd love to I'd love to uh, tear it up, up up with, and these are the guys I I'm gonna get a fight one day. Yeah, I mean you you hear these people all the time, and you know, yeah, well I'll fight those people when I'm in the UFC, and I'll do this, and I'm, and like a part of me is like just just fucking fight. I mean if you look at your record, your record speaks for itself, really. That you can look back over it today. I refresh my memory today and look back over your record. Everyone's on a winning record. Everyone's decent. You've made your way to the to a title shot by beating the guys who are legitimately who you should beat to get to a title shot. So I think when you uh, conduct yourself like that, you will get to the point where you're like, listen, they can, anyone could step in here tonight, and like you're not. You're not aware, you're not too far away that they could say to you now, oh, so and so pulled out. We need you to fight Cerrone because Pettis is pulled out. Yeah. You can walk straight in just because ma- your mentality is, I'm going to fight anyone and I'm going to apply the best me to it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so I think it's uh, I think to be fair, Cage Warriors are, you're probably going to be the the best champion that Cage Warriors have had for a while. In the Jai's all right, but he's not very marketable. Um, you're in te- you're an intelligent guy. You're likable, you work your ass off, and you're willing to fight anyone. Hopefully, Cage Warriors really get behind you and really start to pump you, give you somebody next who is like, listen, if this guy beats this guy, you should be signing to the UFC and not giving people a, a chance. You know? So hopefully that's what will happen. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and hopefully that's what they'll do. Like, I got good relationship with all the Cage Warriors guys. Like, um, I've always made sure if they've asked for anything, I've jumped ahead because... You'd be surprised how many people like they'll they'll ask what you do an interview and they're like oh no I'm cutting weight I'm not interested like even if I don't feel like it I I do them with people like it it, it doesn't matter it's just it's, this is a career at the end of the day like these are things you have to do like um I was ill last week so I didn't really feel like doing anything so when people were messaging me I was like look I was like I'd love to do it but I'm seriously struggling not to shit myself at the moment so can we do it next week and uh, I reschedule and you get done and um, like. I, I enjoy it anyway. Like I said, I enjoy doing interviews and I enjoy doing um, podcasts with people. So this is another part of it. And like, you've got to get used to it because there's no point being the point where you're, um, you're not in, you, you don't want to do anything now because like you see the stuff the UFC guys have to do, like the constantly signing things, the constantly um, sort of sat in press conferences or doing interviews with reporters and stuff. And you, you, you've got to really get used to that and you have to really learn how to speak to people and how to actually speak you know, in the right way and say the right things to attract well, the right people. A fight's 15 minutes for you at the moment. That's 15 minutes for you to show what you've got. And if you stop someone in the first round, you've got five minutes where you've had to show someone. The rest of the time you're not fighting, you've got every opportunity to sell yourself and show people what you actually are. 
talk about you and talk about what you're going to do. You're going to earn your money and you're going to earn, like, listen, we'll all fight for free. We don't tell people that because we want to make money, but we'd fight for free. So you sitting and doing interviews and spending the time, it's just getting people to pay you more money for doing that, basically. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Well, mate, listen, um, any shout outs to anyone? Anyone you want to mention? Thank you, anything like that? Yeah, big shout out to SDC Lens. Obviously, they sponsor me, um, really helped, especially all this shit going on. PP Builders, um, they've sponsored me since day one. Um, CCS Scaffolding is another long term sponsor. Obviously, Tatami Fightwear, um, it's one of my favorite tops, a little bit worn. But uh, Tatami, massive sponsor. Obviously, they sponsored for a long time. Um, uh, Candle Tarts, another one. Like These are these are all people who support and helped along. Um, and a big shout out to everyone watching at home. Um, drop me a message or give me a follow uh, at Mason Jones 1995. That's my Instagram. That's the most thing I'm on. If you need to get hold of me or you want to drop me a message or you have a question, anything at all, drop me a message on Instagram and I'll get back to you. Um, I'm quite quick on the on the replies on the old Instagram, so I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Lovely, mate. Well, mate, listen, I, look, I've really enjoyed it and I could sit and chat to you all day. So I think uh, when this is all sorted and you've got another fight organised, we'll either connect just before the fight and talk about yeah. it or we'll connect when you've won it again and you've defended it and we'll go over the fight again. But, uh, mate, listen, all you've ever got to do is drop me a message and say that you want to you wanna come on if you've got anything you want to talk about and you're more than welcome. And I look forward to training with you once this is all over and we'll, uh, we'll get together, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, 100%. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, mate. Thanks, brother.